the Holy Spirit become and baptize you. And finally, I want you to pray that you will be ready to meet Jesus when he comes. And then I will close 184, do you know that 184? Let's bow our heads and silently, it's between you and God. Our Father in heaven, thank you for allowing each one of us to come to church today. We thank you for waking us up this morning. We thank you for giving us food, clothing, and shelter. But most of all, we are thankful that you are a loving God who came down here over 1,900 years ago so that we might have eternal life. And we pray today that you will baptize each one of us with the Holy Spirit enable us to have the power to overcome every temptation in our life. Help each one of us to be a shining star for you. So when people see us, they'll see Jesus in us. We ask that you will bless each person here, each family that is represented in Jesus' name. Let us all say, Amen. Now I'm going to ask you to stand to your feet and say to somebody sitting next to you, it is no secret. Just stand up. Everybody stand up. And say, shake hands with somebody on your right or on your left. But it is no secret what God can do. And the good thing about it, what he's done for others, he can do for you. For with God, thanks no count. With God, thanks no count. So don't give up. Now 
about the sixth hour, and there cometh a woman of Samaria. Uh -huh. I hear so many people arguing about in the church, should a woman be able to preach, or should a woman be a pastor, and all of that. Jesus made a point, and I'm going to show you before this sermon is over today, of making a woman very important to the church. And you can't do it out. In fact, if all the women got up and moved out, I'm going to move my ministry and follow the women. <laughs> uh, you look around, you look at the things all in the church today. I bet you it's about a five to one ratio of women to me. You want to get something done, you call on the women. And you want to have some talk, you call on the men. But Jesus had to go through Samaria, and Jesus was a master at having a conversation. See, women love good conversation. And he said, I'm going to talk to this woman. And, and, and look, man, you better listen because you might learn something about how Jesus talked to women. He didn't go up there and start flattering her. He said, look, give me a glass of water. <laughs> he knew that woman couldn't give him a glass of water. He, you know, he, she was a Samaritan. And, and the Jews didn't have any deal with Samaritans. Now, I'm talking about the culture back then, see? They, they, they were hung up on the fact that their culture said Jews didn't talk to Samaritans. And a man didn't talk to another woman who wasn't his wife. And yet Jesus was violating all of those things. Got to give you a little hint now. Now, let me jump on that, though. I'm going to jump on that. Verse 16. Stay with me. I'm going to make this sermon short today. But I'm going to stay with me. Jesus said unto her, John 4, 16, Go call thy husband. Now notice that. He asked for some water. And, 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 and uh, then he goes down and he talks to her again. He said, Go call your husband. And, and this is what the woman asked is said, I have no wealth. Jesus said unto her, Thou hast well said, I have no husband, for thou hast had, I mean, five husbands, and he who without thou had is what? Not your husband. And that thou said is truly. Now here Jesus is talking to a woman who is a Samaritan, who was a woman that most of us would look at with a and, and, and look with contempt. And now you shack it up to a man who's not your husband. Well, and Jesus could have quoted the King of Heaven and said, You know, thou shalt not commit adultery. <laughs> he didn't do that, but he said, Look, you know, you, know, you told the truth. You told the truth. Right. But let me tell you something, men, and, 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 and I learned this a long time ago, and I'm still learning it. You know, we have a misconception in society about women. Well, <laughs> <laughs> a lot of women, we look at them and we think that they're one way and they're something. How would you think a woman coming down here would have five husbands and now she's shacking up with another man? Well, let me tell you a little bit about why I think she had five, five husbands. See, and uh, 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 man, listen carefully. Women treat you just like they treat their house when they buy a house. You know, when a woman buys a house, it's not really the house that she wants. But she looks at that house and says, this house got potential. I can put something on the wall. I can buy me some new furniture. I can add another bedroom over here. And maybe one day the house will be my house. Well, well. So now, when she sees this woman, this woman has five husbands now. And see, the first man she met, and look, look now, listen carefully. The first man she met, she said, oh, wait, 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 this is not really the man I want. But he's got potential. If I make him dress differently, if I make him comb his hair differently, maybe put on some different clothes, he might be the man. But see, that first man failed the test. And women don't keep you around if you don't bed it up. They're going to kick you out. So he was 
name for God's true church. And the reason why God doesn't name his true church is because if he had named it, the devil would have had every false church that called themselves by that name. If he had named it first John, every church on the corner would be first John. And you couldn't distinguish God's true church by the name. But what God did, he was more, he was more uh, intelligent than the devil. He said, I'm going to give you the characteristics of my true church. And that way you don't have to worry about the name. But when you see a church that keeps God's all his commandments and have a testimony of Jesus Christ, you know that's my true church. You see that? Now what is the, what is what is the what is the what is the testimony? We can look at it now. It says, keep the commandments of God and have the what? Testimony of what? Jesus Christ. Now what is the testimony? Turn to Revelation chapter 19. The Bible interprets itself. I don't do any interpretation. The Bible interprets itself. Revelation chapter 19. And let's read verse 10. It says, And I fell in his feet to worship him, and he said unto me, See thou do it not. I am thy fellow servant, and I'm thy brother, that have the what? Have the what? Of Jesus Christ, worship God for the what? Is what? Spirit of what? So now you see God's true church keep all of his ten commandments, and the fourth commandment says, Remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. Six days shall not wait and do all thy work, but the what? Seventh day is the Sabbath. Now you can eliminate 99% of the false churches on that one commandment. There is no excuse for you not to recognize God's true church. And then he says, in the testimony, it will have the testimony of Jesus Christ. And the testimony of Jesus Christ is what? Spirit of what? Spirit of prophecy. Now, come with me now. Stay with me now. I'm about to bring this message to a close. I'm not going to preach long. Turn with me to the book of Luke. What book did I say? Luke. The testimony of Jesus is the spirit of prophecy. Now, read with me. Verse number 24. And certain of them which were with us, Luke 24, 24, went to the sepulcher and found it even as the women had said, but him they saw not. Then he said unto them, O fools, and slow of heart to believe all that the who? The who? The prophets have spoken. The testimony of Jesus in the spirit of what? And here he said, beginning in verse, look, 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 verse 27, and beginning at what? Moses and all the what? He expounded unto them in all the scriptures the things concerning himself. So the spirit of prophecy is none other than what? The word of God. So the true church would be distinguished by two characteristics. Number one, they would keep all of God's Ten Commandments. Number two, they would have the spirit of prophecy. And when you find the spirit of prophecy, none other than in the scriptures. This is the prophecy here. So the true church keeps the Ten Commandments and it teaches the whole Bible. Understand? Now, look, look at this, look at this, look at this. It teaches the whole Bible. Now, what does the Bible teach? What did Jesus teach? Let's look at verse 44. This is important. Because I want you to be saved. I want to be saved too. And it's not complicated. It's real simple. And he said, verse 44, And he said unto them, These are the words which I spake unto you while I was yet with you, that all things must be fulfilled, which were written in the law of what? Moses, and then the prophets, and then the psalm concerning me. Then open either understanding that they might understand the word. Now you got it. God's true church is by 
by teaching all of the scriptures and teaching especially to be obedient to the Ten Commandments. And now what does Jesus preach? Verse 47. He said, and that repentance and what? Remission of sin should be preached in what? Amen. Among all nations. Get that truth. Jesus had a simple message. He preached, repent, or you will likewise perish. And most of us don't want to repent. Oh yeah, we like a good gospel, we like a smooth gospel, we like a good smooth sermon that makes us jump and holler and shout and, and all of that and uh, it doesn't require anything but just come to church and shake everybody in and go on. But Jesus said, if you want eternal life, you must repent. What is repentance? Repentance means you make a U-turn when you're going down the and you find you're going down the wrong street, you, you got to make a U-turn and turn around. Now, how do you repent? You repent by making that U-turn and then on a day by day, listen carefully, this is it, this is it. You don't have to worry about yesterday, you can't do anything about the past, I don't care how bad your past is, I don't care how Because you're going to repent. And see, if, if he doesn't change you, you have to repent. And, and the way you know that it's genuine repentance is that when you have a decision, and he's going to give you day by day decisions to make. See, this Christian journey is a one day at a time thing. You can't do anything about tomorrow because tomorrow is not here. You don't even know if you're going to be here tomorrow. So you don't even worry about what's going to happen in the future like that. You can't do anything about the past itself. You can do something about today, and when temptations come to you, you're going to have two choices. One, to yield to temptation, or two, not to yield. See how simple this thing is? It's a matter of you making the right choice every time temptation comes. You got to make it every time it comes, brother Adam. Not 95% of the time when you say 5% of the time I'm going to do the other thing. It's got to be 100% of the time you are going to make that right decision to do what is right in the sight of God. And that's what it means by truly repenting. Truly, sincerely want to be saved. And if you make the right decisions today, don't worry about what happened yesterday. Remember, you confess your sin. Let that be a fact. Don't worry about tomorrow. Just when you get tempted today, right. when you get tempted at sunset tonight, you make the right choice. <laughs> you got to make the right choice. See, God, listen, listen, when God created the world, he said everything was good, didn't he? But everything really wasn't good. It wasn't really good. Listen, listen, and then we'll bring this message to a close. Genesis, let's go back to Genesis. Everything really wasn't good, even though he said it was good. I'm going to show you further by. All right, Genesis chapter 2, what did I say? Genesis chapter 2. Let's read verse number 18 out loud together. Genesis chapter 2. And God said, what? It is what? Thought everything was good. <laughs> now he said, no, no, what is that? It is not what? That man should be what? I'll make a what? So it wasn't all good. And that's why a woman became. Again, important right. in the Bible. Right. See how women are important? So all this stuff about what, what, what women can do and 
back. The God is using them all the way through the back. Amen. They represent his church. Uh, he tells them uh, it wasn't good for man to be alone. And most men know that today. They spent thousands and thousands and thousands of Oh my goodness. But all of God with all his infinite power. Listen to me carefully. But all of his infinite power cannot force you to do one thing. And he will never force you to do what's right. That's the beautiful thing about God. He, he is the creator of the universe. He spoke the world into existence. By his word, it stands. He got the power to resurrect a man to life. But he will not force you to make a good, right decision. That's what you've got to do. Your heart is bound that you are going to have to fight in the battle against yourself. When no one else is around, will you make the right decision? When no one else is looking, will you make the right decision? And I'll tell you, if you make the right decision, you're going to be just like that woman over in John 4. Let's go back over there. We're going to wind this up in John 4 again. This woman who Jesus had to see, he had to see, when he got to talking with this woman, what did she do? John chapter 4. John chapter 4. Let's, let's go down to the end of it. John chapter 4, verse 28. The woman then left her what? Water pot and went her way into the city and said to the well, Come see a man which told me all things that ever I did is not this the Christ. This woman was so caught up in Jesus, she left everything. Left a water pot and couldn't get to the city fast enough to tell people about Jesus. Verse number 39. And many of the Samaritans of that city believed on him for the sake of the woman which testified, he told me all that ever I need. And verse 41. And many more believed because of his own word and said unto the woman, Now we believe not because of thy saith, for we have heard. And know that this is indeed the Christ, the Savior of the world. This woman was so excited about Jesus. How many of you all are excited about telling somebody about Jesus and they don't have to do that? You heard the message, you know what Jesus wants us to do. Are you excited about telling others about him? Are you excited about telling them that he's coming back again? I could have preached about something and some things is getting ready to happen that would make you shiver almost in your boots. But if you don't wake up to the reality of the time in which we are living, a lot of people are going to go to their grave unprepared. Why do you think we're having so many violent storms? Why do you think that we're having these violent earthquakes? All of this stuff that's happening because Jesus is about to come. The devil knows he has for a short time and he's doing everything in his power to take as many people to the grave unprepared for eternity as he can. And looks like he's winning the battle. Looks like he's winning the battle. What did that man say last week when he preached? He said that 18 million, uh, seven and a half minutes preaching and about five or seven billion people in the world. These 18 a million preachers will never reach those five or six million people. It's going to take every one of us making a commitment like this woman that we're going to be excited about telling people that Jesus is about to come. And how do I know he's about to come? Daniel 12, for the Holy Spirit making me turn now to this other verse. I, I really want to quit, but it, it's telling me to turn to Daniel 12, 4. And you've got to read this. You've got to read this, Daniel 12, 4. It tells us, it tells us something very important. It says in Daniel 12, 4, Thou, O Daniel, shut up the word, seal the book, even to the time of the end. Many shall run to and fro, and knowledge shall be increased. If ever there was a time when knowledge has increased, it is now. You can study the history, but you'll never find a period when they have an internet. A worldwide web, but you have it now. And Google 
You just get in it and you say it just like you tell your GPS, I want to go down to 685 East Mountain, and it drives you there. Thank you. 
watch and you want to live 100% for Jesus Christ. I'm not asking you to join any church now. I'm asking you, do you want to live 100% for Jesus Christ? If you do, I want you to come down for a special prayer. But because it's going to take prayer, it's going to take a baptism of the Holy Spirit to enable you to do it. You won't be able to do it in your own power. You won't be able to do it in your own strength. It's only by leaking up with Jesus Christ when he puts his hand on you that you'll be able to live 100% for him. Time to wind it up. Time is running out. Time is running out. But you want to live for Christ 100%. Not 99%, but 100%. I'm going to ask you to just join hands now. And I'm going to ask for their will. Their will to come up front. I want you to come down and say, I'm going to live for Jesus Christ 100%. And we're going to to pray for us this morning. God sees you. He knows your heart. He knows who you are. He doesn't care about your past. All he's concerned about is do you want to be saved? And if you're willing, he will take your hand and you will make it. Have a little prayer for us this morning. Father God, we come this morning. Thank you, Lord. We know, Father, that through all our trials, through all our tribulation, we need you. And Father, as we suffer around this heart, not only for ourselves, but we pray for this world in which we live. We realize we live in a fallen world, Father. Our things are getting dim, closer to them. We know, Father, the light that you shine forth in our lives. Make us to a brighter day when we see you coming in the cloud of glory. We pray, Lord, that we'll be ready to receive you. We pray for those that stand around and hold hands. We ask you to forgive us of our sins. Cleanse them from all unrighteousness. And then help us, Lord, to be obedient to your word. Help us to share this word with others. We know that this world, Father, is in turmoil because of the chaos that Satan is putting in the hearts and the minds of people, Father, that don't believe in your word, Father. And the only way we can survive is be a witness for you. So, Lord, let us be a light and a lost and a dying world. Let us be salty touch the lives of others that don't want to hear the truth. But you say you're the way, the truth, and the life. So Lord, this life that we live ought to be able to touch other lives. Ought to be able to strengthen and be obedient to your word that we will uh, seek to do your will, Father. But we need your spirit. Without your spirit, we can't be a witness. We're not good at nothing we do without you, Lord. Because you said in your word, we live and move and have our being because you live in us. We thank you for your Holy Spirit today. Thank you for just blessing us right now. And thank you, Lord, for saving us and sanctifying us. Keep us, Father, blessed each and every one of our families. Bless those that are grieved. Bless those that are sick, those that are shitting in. And most of all, Father, keep us with your hand of mercy on each of our lives. Until we see you coming in clouds of glory, we pray. These and other blessings in Jesus' name. Let the church say amen. Amen. God bless you, may you may return to your seats.